The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guests or hosts are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced or the Molecular Research Incorporated. Welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. We are all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. In each episode, we will feature very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to live their best lives naturally. Thanks for tuning in to Supplementing Health. Concussions are a common occurrence for all ages, and yet many North Americans know very little about this topic. In 2016 to 2017, 46,000 children aged 5 to 19 had concussions, and according to the CDC estimates, about 1.6 to 3.8 million sports and recreation related concussions occur every single year in the U.S. So today I'm excited to introduce Dr. Mindy Marr, a board certified chiropractic sport physician. Dr. Marr has over 20 years of professional experience with pro athletes and teams to draw on and is a spokesperson for the Foundation of Chiropractic Progress and TIPS, speaking nationwide on concussion management and sports injury. Welcome Dr. Marr, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so you've obviously had a lot of experience with concussions in your practice, dealing with so many different athletes at various different levels. Um, can you share how concussions can affect mood and personality, if at all, and what kind of changes you've observed within your practice? Concussions absolutely do affect personality and mood. And in fact, I would say knowing whether it's your athletes or, or your patients or even just family members, it's, it's one of the easiest ways to determine if, if something is something unusual has happened more than just the chief complaint or a, of a headache or just a little bit of dizziness is understanding that maybe someone is behaving in a way that's, you know, quote unquote, not normal for them. A concussion is essentially a contusion or a bruising of the brain. It's, well, it's, it's a few things, but Think, think of a concussion as a bruise of the brain. And when it bruises different areas of the brain, that's when we see the symptomatology related to where the, con to where the concussion affects the brain that affects the signs and symptoms someone is experiencing thereafter. So mood swings, emotional expressions, often caused by damage to certain areas of the brain that controls emotions and behavior. It's also important to understand that the brain is really susceptible to overstimulation post head trauma, regardless, there's various types of uh, mild traumatic brain injuries, but things like bright lights, loud noises, cognitive activities like thinking, problem solving, reading, working on the computer, doing homework, those are normal day activities that when someone sustains a concussion or a different type of a head trauma, it can really easily over, overwhelm the brain as far as, as how is the brain works. And as a result, on top of where the, the concussion may bruise the brain, someone that's experiencing the overstimulation of the brain post concussion, they can react confused, frustrated, angry, because they know that the brain just isn't functioning the way it should at that point in time. So there's also, on top of the actual bruising of the brain, frustration that comes out of the brain not healing or working as, as, as quickly or normal as, as it usually does. And how long is it um, normal after a, or after a brain injury to experience these symptoms? Is there a time frame that would be normal and at some point it becomes concerning if they persist? Typically, seven to ten days is is the usual time frame for an adult as far as having concussive like symptoms and resolving on their own. With children, it's it's more of a three to four week timeline. So it, usually, the 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 first time someone has a concussion or a head trauma, they they tend to resolve pretty quick. Excuse me, pretty quickly within the the time frame I just mentioned. But it's it's still hard to say exactly 
this is the time frame when you're going to get better. Every everyone who sustains a concussion, it's it's a very individualized reaction, symptomatology, and healing time. There are factors that can influence how long a concussion may linger. Um, a history of previous head injuries, for example. Um, anyone who's predisposed to headache disorders, such as migraines. Someone that perhaps has been diagnosed with a learning disability, such as ADD or dyslexia. Those are all factors that might indicate or explain why someone is taking a little bit longer for their concussion symptoms to resolve compared to textbook normal. But again, the seven to day timeframe with adults, it's, it's anywhere from an 80 to 90% recovery timeframe. With children, it does take a little bit longer because their, their, brains, their brains take longer to, to, to heal because they're like with bones, muscles, everything that, that grows over time when, uh, in the pediatric age, it's the same thing with brains. They have less white matter. The, the neurons don't fire as fast. So that's why in children, it does take a little bit longer for those concussions to heal. Um, there's, there's some other pred predictions as far as when we're talking post-concussive symptoms, Sim concussions that don't resolve within the normal seven to 10 days for adults, three to four weeks within children. There have been a few variables that have been found in link to the prediction of someone developing post-concussive syndrome, which in that case, the symptoms can last or anywhere from two to 12 months. Uh, female sex, we know, is a, a predictable variable. Those, again, that have been diagnosed with, with migraine, learning disabilities, someone who's had a concussion previously where their symptoms lasted for more than a week, we do know that that's actually a variable for predicting post-concussive symptoms and um, fatigue, phonophobia, headache, some of those classic signs um, and symptoms that someone sustains after a, a concussion. If those are a little bit more on the severe side, that can be a, um, a predictable variable as well for a little bit of a, a longer recovery time. Now, when we think of concussions, often I think many of us think of major head traumas, right? Like you're getting smacked around, but concussions can occur from smaller injuries as well. So can you share what some of the less, or I guess maybe common but less known um, causes of concussions could be? Good point. I think more and more of us are starting to realize now with just the information being more readily available and, and discussed, you don't have to be hit directly on the head, losing consciousness to sustain a concussion. Obviously, it's something very common that we see in sports and athletics. You don't have, it's, you can be, you can be hit anywhere in the body, really, and it's just kind of a little bit more of that, that, that whiplash that, that takes place to the head region, not so much a direct blow to the head, but even more of a whiplash that, that can cause a pain. So I think a lot of people sometimes are a bit curious or surprised knowing that someone like myself, a sports chiropractor or just chiropractors in general, along with physical therapists, that we do know quite a bit about concussions, maybe, maybe more than, than people um, realize or give us credit for. And the reason for that is a lot of people coming into our offices, again, physical therapists, occupational therapists, chiropractors, people come in very routinely for headaches, dizziness, neck pain. And because a book didn't fall directly on their head or because it wasn't, it wasn't blunt force trauma, they just think it's just you know your classic headache or i need i need i need an adjustment or i've got a knot in my neck so to speak it's then with going through detailed history discussion examination and and going back to what i said before just knowing your patients and, and you can just kind of tell if something behavioral is is a little bit off that's when you can ask the right questions and realize oh hey someone you know kind of tripped down the stairs caught themselves but didn't realize they actually had quite a bit of whiplash when they when they gathered their balance and that could have shaken the brain enough internally within the cranium to kind of scratch up and bruise up the brain probably one of the most unusual concussions i've ever had walk into my office so to speak is is someone who fell out of bed having a nightmare and i'd known this patient for quite some time so they came to see me this was a few years ago you know, classic, hey, I think I need, I think I need an adjustment, had a weird dream, kind of, you know, knock my head and have a headache, you know, can you just uh, check my neck and see if everything's in alignment? And it was through further discussion, it was deemed that actually, no, the balance is off. We took him through some, some serial examination and testing. Balance is a bit off. Cognitively, I could just tell something was a bit off, a little bit slow with the way he spoke. 
So there can be really unusual ways that someone sustains a contusion or a bruising of the brain, AKA concussion. It's not just blunt force trauma. And that's something that I think we're starting to realize more in everyday life and everyday practice. It's not just the hard hits. It's not just the serious motor vehicle accidents. It's not just on the football field that, that people can bruise up their brain. No, like you mentioned there, football, a lot of people do think of sports, obviously, as one of the primary causes of concussions, and it is usually high contact sports like football, like hockey. Um, can you also get them in kind of one individualized sports or sports where you're not getting that impact then too, if it, it's as easy as, you know, tripping and falling to get a concussion? You can. I would say it's definitely more common in sports where there's it's where it's contact sport, boxing, rugby. It, it is much more common to to sustain a concussion that way. If you're talking a sport, maybe more like like tennis, for example, where it's a, an individualized sport. Chances are, unless you're being you know, not so much being in the in the way of getting hit with the tennis ball, so to speak, but just the running back and forth, track and field, for example it's probably not as common sustaining a concussion in those sports, but obviously someone can trip and fall. There could be that weird tennis ball, lacrosse ball flying at your head. And again, anything that induces some sort of whiplash trauma to the body that works its way up to the cervical spine and the cranium where the brain lives, that can definitely, that can lead to a concussion, sure. But it's, it, we, it is a bit more common in, in contact sports. Um, basketball and soccer, however, those are two really, con as, as far as statistically, females are at greater risk for concussion in those two sports, basketball and, and soccer, compared to their male counterparts. We, we have the, the data and the research on that now. Basketball and soccer, that's, it's kind of an in-between. It's, it's not always direct contact. Sometimes it is. So it just, it just depends. But the, but the stats definitely show that as to your point, the ice hockey, the football, that's, that's where we see the higher rate of, of concussions. It's also important to note that not all concussions go reported. So the stats that you mentioned, um, they're, 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 all, they're all true stats and figures, but we definitely believe that how many people, whether it be through a sports-related concussion or just, you know, just your, your average mild traumatic brain injury concussion, we do believe that the stats are much higher than what's being reported. Um, not everyone goes to the hospital or the doctor when they sustain a whiplash injury that, that could technically be a concussion. Not everyone in sports reports it to their athletic trainer or to their coach. It's interesting that women or females tend to have a higher rate in basketball and soccer than their male counterparts. Um, is there any evidence as to why that is? It is thought that one of the main reasons with, with, with females in mind is, is that their neck strength isn't as strong as their male counterparts. So that's definitely something that, that we do implement as far as when it comes to therapeutic exercise, strength and conditioning is definitely neck strengthening. Uh, women just tend to be, generally speaking, a bit smaller, smaller muscles, smaller craniums. So that's that's a big reason. It, it could go back to 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 train you know how training practices um, how they're being coached. We also think, as I mentioned previously, there's there's part of that is that females tend to report their injuries more readily than their male counterparts. That might have something to do with it as well. Basketball and soccer are becoming increasingly popular with females. So all of those factors, I think, is why we're seeing now present day more concussions being sustained and reported in basketball and soccer, female versus males. Now, is there any detriment to not reporting a concussion to your doctor if you do sustain one? Oh, um, absolutely. It's uh, a lot of the times concussions, they, the, the signs and symptoms sometimes show up right away, but it's an evolving condition. It's an evolving injury. Sometimes you don't have signs or symptoms for 24 to 72 hours. I've, I've witnessed that firsthand over the years. So a lot of times, we'll, we'll just talk specifically about sports and athletes, they, they don't, if it just seems like, hey, they just, you know, got hit from the back, a little bit of whiplash, they feel fine, they can get up, they can play, pretty much every athlete's going to want to stay on the field. So athletes, especially at the professional level, they, they're, they are instructed, they, they know enough not to hide injuries, but at the end of the day, a lot of them want to stay on the field. A lot of them might not have immediate symptoms 
that they think that they need to walk off the field and speak to the trainer, the sports chiro, or their coach to about. With these symptoms creep up, however, even if it's just a few minutes later, that's when we risk something called second impact syndrome. And that it's very unusual second impact syndrome, but it, it does happen. Second impact syndrome is essentially when there is a concussion that gets sustained. So think of it as if, if you, you injure your wrist, you injure your ankle, there is some immediate swelling that takes place, right? And what the problem is, is that when you have a concussion and that there's some immediate swelling of the brain, you might be asymptomatic or even lucid to some degree, but at some point, depending on, on the effects of the concussion, the brain does swell. And unfortunately, the brain has nowhere to go but down because the cranium doesn't expand. It's everywhere else on our body, the, the, the swelling can expand and we all know that swelling um, can, get, can get rather big and boggy at times. So the problem with staying on the field or continuing your activity when you've already have a when you have a, a an immediate and fresh concussion taking place if you were to get hit or sustain a, another significant whiplash type of injury that's when the swelling really doubles down and again there is nowhere to go that brain and the, the swelling of the brain but down when i say down i mean it starts hitting the lower part of your brain the the pons the midbrain the medulla obligata these are all where your cranial nerves live. It's responsible for your heart rate, your blood pressure, uh, vital systems that keeps you alive. So when that pressure works its way down, it's 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 a it's very very serious. If someone isn't transported to the hospital for um, immediate emergent care, it's unfortunately almost a, always a guarantee of death. Oh wow! Um, now, if you've had previous concussions, does that increase your likelihood of developing things like second impact syndrome or CTE or any other, um, I guess, long-term effects? Um, yeah, so as far as if you've had a concussion before, second impact syndrome happens when it's kind of like back-to-back -back concussions. If someone has a, had a concussion, let's say sustained a concussion today, and six months later, they, they go on the soccer field or the baseball field again, sustain another concussion. It doesn't necessarily put them at risk for second impact syndrome. It's, it, it, what it does though is, I mean, I've, I've known athletes that have had anywhere from three to six concussions within a period of a few years. And no, that's, that's not good. You don't wanna keep re-injuring the brain. The more you injure the brain or, or really anything else in your body for that matter, the weaker it becomes, the more susceptible it becomes to injury, the harder it's going to be you know, able to, to return back to, to, full, to full functioning. Um, going back to your, your CT, it's, it's hard to know. We do have a lot of information coming out on CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy these days. I don't know if sustaining one concussion makes you immediately prone to CTE. It's, there's just so much more research that we need to do. CTE, the cause of CTE is there is so hundreds and millions and millions and millions of neurons or brain cells in your brain. So very, very teeny tiny structures, the axon, that's the skinny part of the neuron. That is the weakest link of the brain cell. So anytime there's blunt force trauma, whiplash, shaking, the axons, they, they, they shear and they tear and, 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 and they, and that's it. Um, what keeps surrounding the axons, I just, I don't want to get too, too involved in my description here, but you, you've got structures that surround the axons and they're, they're, microtub they're microtubules. These tubes help carry cellular waste, um, oxygen, blood flow, et cetera, to, from one end of the neuron to the other. So when the axon breaks, these, these microtubules, they break pretty easily too. And the axon can sometimes withstand, when I say the axon again, that's, that's the skinny part of the nerve in your brain. So there can be some movements, some shaking that doesn't necessarily shear or tear the axons each and every time, but these tubes that are extremely tiny surrounding the axons, they break and damage a lot easier. It doesn't, make to, to, it doesn't take a lot to, to, to break them on a regular basis. These little tubes are held together by a protein called tau. That's spelled T-A-W. So every time there is some damage or some injury to these microtubules, the protein tau separates. It's no longer holding these, these tubes together. And over time, 
they they start to band and clump together and over time these clumps of tau start to build up in certain areas of the brain hence affecting the brain as with um the, the cognitive symptoms that a lot of the times mimic alzheimer's and we see the buildup of the tau in the brain upon autopsy. As of right now, there's, there's no blood tests or imaging right now to determine buildup of tau in the brain while one is still alive. Obviously, that's some, uh, trying to figure out how we can do that. But all the, uh, so as of right now, it's, it's autopsying the brain to determine if, if there is a significant buildup of tau and if that is what contributed to CTE and ultimately death. So that's 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 the big thing. That's one of the, the big things that's that's being worked on in the field of concussion is how do we determine if someone has a, a significant buildup of tau, how can we keep it at a minimum? But there's there's really no way once the damage is done to the axons and the microtubules, the damage is done. Um, and does that go for any neurological damage that's sustained from a concussion, or can some of it be reversed? Once, once nerve cells die, they die. Um, we've got a fair amount of them in the brain, but once you start to lose too many, it's, they don't necessarily regenerate the way, the way bone does. You can break your bones, that regenerates. Your fingernails, your hair, it grows, it regenerates. Once there is cell death in the brain, the neurons die, they don't, they don't grow back. Okay, um, and so if you had previously um, experienced a concussion or had a concussion occur, what are some of the physical and mental symptoms that should be red flags if they persist for an excessive amount of time or maybe crop up again after you've quote unquote recovered? So if you mean like two or three, you mean two or three months as far as like a long time since one sustained a concussion? Yeah. Okay, so, right, because going back to what I said, the seven to, day, seven to 10 days for adults, three to four weeks with children. So if these, if symptoms, whether it's your first concussion or your third concussion down the road, if it's still ongoing two, three, four months later, that's something known as post-concussive syndrome, then it is important to follow up with your doctor, your neurologist. There's, a, there's different examinations that we do. It's, there's different examinations that we do on the field immediately, as far as like memory recall, for example, uh, co cognitive exams, different balancing tests that we do, a cranial nerve exam. So if these symptoms are ongoing, more often than not, someone is experiencing dizziness and headache. Those are two of the most common post-concussive symptoms one will experience and that's when we need to start thinking that the vestibular system has not quite recovered the vestibular system is part of our inner ear there's quite a few structures in the inner ear that make up the vestibular system and that's that's involved with how we keep our balance our sense of spatial orientation so a lot of the times again with whether it's blunt force trauma violent shaking significant whiplash there's there can be some damage to the inner ear that's just not resolving quickly on its own. Vestibular rehab we know has um, very very effective for someone suffering from post concussive post concussive signs and symptoms. A lot of physical therapists actually now specialize purely in vestibular rehab. So outside of the dizziness and the headache, if someone is still having maybe more like the, the, the emotional signs and symptoms, just personality wise is just not what it used to be, so to speak, then that would, I would say, warrant a follow up, both a, both a neurologist and, and perhaps even a psychologist or specifically a sports psychologist. Fantastic. Um, I think this is such a fascinating topic. I think it's something that obviously, as you said, there's still a ton of research that is going into it and is regularly developing. But I think especially because so many of us do enjoy different activities or, you know, um, partake in different sports, things like that, that this is a reality for many people, obviously, throughout North America. It's something that it's really great to discuss further and learn more about. Um, the brain itself is so fascinating, so the injuries to it can be very fascinating as well. <laughs>
Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's fascinating. And I think for a lot of people, it, it can be kind of scary. Um, and we want to, we want to definitely take it seriously. I know a lot of parents in, in, you know, in the last decade or so have had concerns. Should I put my child in, in football? Would you put your child in football? And like everything else, it, it's a risk versus reward. I, my own personal take is I don't think keeping kids out of sports 100% in fear of a head trauma or a concussion, that's, I know that that, there, the other side of that is then your child is losing out on all the benefits of sports, um, gaining confidence, working with the team, the, the, the physical activity, learning how to be a good sportsman, cooperation, all of, there's, there's so many benefits of being involved with sports and, and, and playing sports that while, you know, everything's a, everything's a risk. So you just want to make sure, I would just say to, you know, anyone that's concerned with, with kids or teenagers at home that are maybe, you know, kind of weighing the risk, the risk versus reward, you know, that's when you want to just have, you know, get to know your coach, get to know the athletic trainer or the sports chiropractor working on the sidelines. Um, Get, understand, you know, is there is there some sort of a protocol? Should should someone go down on the field? Where is the nearest hospital? What what is the plan? There should always be a plan. Worst case scenario. So I would say for any any parent or person that, that has these concerns, then just you know have that open dialogue before the season starts. Or you know if if you're if you're joining your weekend warrior and you're gonna you know pick up a go to the park and, and, and pick up the game, then, you know, just be responsible for yourself if, if it's not an organized event. Just just have a game plan, a little bit of a first aid, just, you know, just kind of knowing the basic signs and symptoms. You don't have to be uh, a doctor or someone who specializes in concussion rehab to, to just know the basic mechanism of injury, basic signs and symptoms, and just, you know, when in doubt, rule it out. Fantastic. So if any of our listeners wanted to continue to learn from you on this subject or work with you, what would be the best way for them to get a hold of you? My website is, if that would be helpful, it's SD, like San Diego, sdcenterforhealth.com. That's a good way to, to look me up and learn more about me. And I, I do believe my contact information is there as well. Fantastic. This has been a great conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time to enlighten us all with your boundless knowledge on this topic. I really enjoyed speaking with you and hopefully I was able to, to, to share some, some information that was helpful to your listeners. And thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Supplementing Health. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcast or aor.us slash podcast. Do you have a topic you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca.